Thank you all for singing out and participating in that. Thank you for reading those scriptures. Um, we're going to see if we can't tie this all together, fit these pieces together. All right, thank you. As Christian women and young ladies, we all face struggles in fitting everything into our life. Teenagers are having to balance schoolwork, with uh, sometimes part-time jobs and work to be done in the household, as well as their growing need to be more social butterflies. Young adults are facing many of life's decisions, whether to marry, whether to work outside the home, where to live, whether to have children or not. Young mothers are struggling to balance keeping the house, going here, <laughs> struggling uh, to keep balance, uh, keeping the house clean, meals cooked, children cared for, in addition to many of them working a job away from the home. Middle-aged women are dealing with all ca the cares of keeping a house running smoothly, in addition to dealing with teenage children and the reality of many times having to care more and more <clears throat> for their aging parents. For the older woman, they are struggling in other ways. It might be health issues keeping them from doing what they are used to doing and still want to do, in addition to having a sharp decrease in their monthly income. The struggles of each age are really real and must be dealt with in accordance with God's will. This session, we will be looking at how we can fit pieces together. As was read just a moment ago, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple uh, in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for, the, for God by the Spirit. Again, in Ephesians 5, 4, 15 and 16, we read, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Another version uses the uh, phrase, fitly joined together. After working these puzzles, we'd, we would try to get some of the pieces together and they kind of went, but they kind of didn't. We were trying to fit them together but God's word will help us to do that. It's not a process that's just going to happen. It's something we have to work at. Let's begin by taking a look at the first part of this puzzle as we try to understand what God's will for us is. The first puzzle piece is self. Paul tells us in Romans 2, 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's definitely a tall order. There are so many choices in life, but God made us with the free will ability to make informed choices. Do we always make the right choices? Definitely not. After all, we're human. But the choice is there to make. Will I go to college? What career will I choose? Will I get married? Will my husband uh, and I choose to have children? Will I be a faithful Christian? Will I be busy in the Lord's work? To help us make wise choices, let's look at some questions that we must ask. What are the facts about the situation? Make sure that you're looking at the reality of each situation. 
what will be the consequences of the choice I make? We need to weigh the consequences in light of the impact on our life as well as on the lives of the others in our household. What is the best choice based on your discernment of needs and wants of those around you? Your husband may come in very excited about having been given two tickets to a basketball day game and he wants you to go with him that night. You have ironing that you had planned to do. Does anybody iron anymore? <laughs> but you have ironing that you were planning to do and you must weigh the impact of which is better to do. Make your husband happy by spending some time with him or getting the ironing done. How compatible is your choice with your personal goals? When you become a Christian, you set a personal goal, that of living faithfully for Christ for the rest of your life. Will your current decision have an impact on that goal? What about trying to decide on whether to marry a non-Christian? Lastly, what are biblical guidelines for the choice? A good example of this would be the choices of how we take responsibility for caring for our children or others. The golden rule in Matthew 7, 12, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, so do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets, should guide many of our decisions. Other verses to consider that would help us make good choices are Proverbs 22, 6, about training up a child, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, about husbands and wives and their relationship, and 1 Timothy 3, 11, with the qualification of uh, deacons' wives. In addition to making choices, we must learn to set goals. You need to set spiritual goals for your life. Studying the Bible should be at the very top of your list of goals. Just realize that sometimes goals will change. You might have set a goal for not getting married, but if and when that right person comes along, that goal's gonna change. After setting goals, you need to prioritize them. Next, you'll need to determine what activities will help you achieve those goals. Of course, to make the best goals, we need to begin and end with God. He needs to be included in every phase of our decision-making and goal-setting. For those who have chosen to be married, you need to remember that the responsibility of the home remains yours, according to Titus 2.5. If you are also working outside the home, you might share many of those tasks in the home, but the responsibility is still yours. You set the tone for the home and are to make it a happy and a secure place to be. Love is a decision. It is one that should be made with great thought. Your attitude toward love will affect every relationship you have. Home, family, neighbors, work, church. Make sure you are practicing biblical love in each and every decision you make. To make this piece of the puzzle complete, we must take care of personal needs. Each one of us is unique. God has made every person with characteristics special only to that person. Have you ever just sat somewhere watching people go by? I love to sit at the airport and watch people. Everyone is different. They look different, they walk different, they dress differently, they deal with stresses differently. They have completely different personalities. To be the best person you can be, you must know yourself. Learn what stresses you out the most. Then learn what triggers that stress. We must learn how to manage stress in our lives. We are told in Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Then in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we are told, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. 
God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This tells us that we can manage the stress in our lives. It might be helpful to try to prepare for any situations that you know push your buttons. You need to determine what really matters to you. For some people, they get really stressed out if their house is not spotless. I am definitely not one of those people. But if you are, you need to determine why that matters so much to you and then look at the situation with clear eyes and try to find a solution. It may mean assigning various tasks to others in the household. It might mean getting up a little earlier or staying up a little later to accomplish those things that will stress you if you don't have them completed. It might mean that you need to decide whether having the floor uh, being mopped every day or two is worth the stress and anxiety and maybe even bitterness that comes between you and family members. Sometimes it is something simple, like managing your time, like we talked about in the first lesson. The second piece of our puzzle is parents. Most parents have sacrificed much to give their children a better life. In most cases, it is our parents who have had the most influence over the way we live our lives. Sometimes that influence has been for good. Sometimes it has been negative. Our parents have invested time in training us, uh, and our parents usually are our greatest cheerleaders. We tend to get so wrapped up in our daily lives that the time with our parents is limited. That is probably a natural thing, and especially if you have moved to another area to live. It is really important that we maintain a relationship with our parents throughout our life. We are told in 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 4, honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing <laughs> in the sight of God. Paul goes on to say in verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So how do we accomplish this? One, maintain contact with your parents at least weekly by phone or in person if possible. Schedule times to visit your parents as often as, as possible. Include your parents in your children's activities, such as ball games and school activities, even if they can't attend, they enjoy knowing what is happening in your family. Be sure to send cards on special days. If they live out of town, write to them as often as possible. When we lived in Charleston, my parents lived in Michigan. One time we were up there visiting and I was looking on my mother's desk and there was a stack of letters from each of uh, my siblings and myself. I asked my mother, I said, Mama, why did you keep all these letters? And she said, when I'm lonely, I sit down and I read them over again and again and again. It makes me feel like you're sitting right there with me. I had never realized how much those simple letters telling what was going on in our household meant to my mother. So be sure to stay in touch with them, especially if you're in a long distance. Be sure to tell your parents that you love them. Yes, children love to hear our parents tell us that they loved us, but parents like to hear it too. Do it every day. Be the uh, example that you should be every time you call or write by telling them you love them. Probably the most important thing you can do for your parents is to pray for them. Be that Christian example that would make your parents proud of you. It might mean having to become a parent to your parent 
when they can no longer live on their own. We did that with both of our mothers until they got to a point that it required more care and attention than we could give them in our home. But I don't regret for one minute taking them, giving them a place that was safe and secure and have companionship and love. Our next piece of the puzzle is the church. What a blessing your church family can and should be in every aspect of your life. If you were privileged to have grown up in the church, you already know what a blessing this is. We are told in Psalm 37, 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. It is important for us to participate, to do our share, and to reflect our love for Christ by being involved in those activities which we believe will bring glory to our Lord. Children are called to be salt and light. That means we must be active in living out our Christianity. Jesus certainly provided us with an excellent example of how to live the Christian faith. Our service to the church requires a commitment. This was expressed in Philippians 2.7 when Jesus said he was taking the form or nature of a servant. There are some important considerations in determining where you will spend your time and energy in Christian living. Church activities may be determined by abilities and time. When you have small children, you may be somewhat limited in some activities, but don't let your children stand in the way of you being active in the Lord's kingdom. If you are caring for aging parents, you might be more limited than you were in other, uh, at other times of your life. Paul reminds us in uh, Romans 12, 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. You need to make thoughtful and prayerful decisions about how you can best serve the church. Service activities may be based on stages of your family. When your children are little, you probably want to be involved with the teaching of the children their ages. But then later, you'll want to be involved in the teenage activities. One thing everyone needs to remember, you must be involved in service somewhere in the Lord's kingdom. Find your niche in the church. Just attending services doesn't satisfy your obligation to be involved in the activities of the congregation. Parents of young, young children, I highly recommend that you make visits, especially to the elderly of the congregation, but take your children with you. Most elderly people love having children visit with them. Plus, you're setting an example that they will follow on into their adulthood. We should never use our children as an excuse for not doing something in the church. The key issue for the Christian woman is the realization that her Christianity is just not something to be juggled. It is the overriding reason for even trying to figure out how to fit things together in light of our faith. Our next piece of the puzzle is career. When we take inventory of our life, we will be better able to see where and if a career will be part of that life. Usually, young people between 14 and 25 are thinking about what they want to do with their lives. Many will know early on what their career path is, if any, that they want to take. For others, it may be several years before they know what they want to do with their life. Many of this age are weighing the decision of a career and or marriage. Here are some suggestions concerning our career path. Complete an aptitude test and interest inventory to help make your decision. You certainly don't want to go into a career path, spend a lot of money in education for that career, and then get into that career and find you absolutely hate it. You've wasted time and money and you're back to square one. That being said, don't ever be afraid of making a change if that's what's needed. 
seeking the best for our lives, as Paul prayed in Philippians, may necessitate making changes which are uncomfortable and even frightening at first. Next, identify your opportunities and constraints. You certainly don't want to pursue a career path that has no job opportunities in the job in which you plan to live. Look at where you are in life, where you want to be. Things will change. I always wanted to be an elementary school teacher. I attended Fried Hardeman for two years. It was only a junior college at that time. Well on my way to becoming an elementary school teacher. But then I met Ferris and those plans changed. And you know what? That's okay. I never did complete my teaching degree, but I've taught hundreds if not thousands of children in Bible classes for well over 50 years. I was able to fulfill my desire to teach by teaching children about God. How much better is that than teaching them how to read and add two and two? There were times that I did work outside the home in a job to help cover extra expenses that we incurred. When you have children in college, it gets expensive. <laughs> Ultimately, what you do with that regards to a career should be a decision made by you if you're single or you and your spouse if you're married in light of God's word and what works for you and your family. If choosing to have a career, just make sure it's something that you enjoy. Be sure to look at your family responsibilities when making career decisions. Juggling a career and motherhood can be very exhausting. It can be done, but everyone in the household needs to do their part in maintaining the household responsibilities. Remember, as I said earlier, ultimately managing the household is our responsibility. We might share the tasks, but it's our responsibility. It is important that career choices be made as a result of prayer and choosing a life's work that is consistent with God's plan. I love the way Mitch Henry, the incoming president of Faulkner University, put it. He said that while teaching young men to preach the gospel is a very important part of Faulkner University, he likes to think of the school as a vocational school. It trains young people to be Christian teachers, Christian nurses, Christian lawyers, Christian athletes, Christian accountants. If you choose to have a career, make sure you set a Christian example in whatever your career choice might be. If you choose a, to have a career, do, do not let it consume you. Arrive and leave work on time. Find time savers and use them. Determine where you waste time and be a better manager of your time. Delegate responsibility. Be sure to look at all the ways that working outside of the home will impact your husband, your children, and your service to God. Look at why you want a career. That answer will help you to be a better adjustment in your choices. Now we're ready for the fifth piece of our puzzle. It is that of a husband. The reality of life is that most women will choose to marry and share a happily ever after relationship. The need for the marriage relationship defined by physical, emotional, and social components is God given and a blessing. In our society today, marriage is looked upon as something for the moment if I don't like it, I can get a divorce and try another one. But we know that marriage, in God's eyes, from the very beginning, was one man with one woman for life. In Genesis 2, uh, 18 and following, God puts it this way. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Marriage requires a commitment and constant work to make that marriage what God wants it to be. Every marriage will have its ups and downs, but that's where the work comes in. 
We cannot abandon our marriage for these ups and downs. When you choose to marry, you have decided to complicate your life by including the needs of another person in the complex fabric of your future. But oh, it can be so rewarding. But it should be a decision that you don't make or take lightly. Let me read what a paragraph of, uh, from the book Fitting It All Together says, quote, Learn what God wants your relationship with your husband to become. Determine the direction of your responsibilities to your marriage relationship and invest your time in their goal management. In Ephesians 5, we are told that we as wives are to submit to our husbands and respect our husbands. Husbands are commanded to love their wives as Christ loved the church and as they love their own bodies. Be sensitive to his spiritual needs and to your own. Support each other. Invest in your marriage by accepting and fulfilling God's guidelines for your marriage. Good marriages are built on thoughtful ideas, <coughs> planning, and following the plan. End quote. What excellent advice. Give your husband space, just as sometimes you need space. I read of a man who every day upon coming home would stop by a tree in the yard. He appeared to be hanging something there, but nothing could ever be seen. When asked what he was doing, he said, there are things that happened at work, but I don't want to bring them all home into the house. So he would hang them up each morning or evening and pick them all back up the next morning. We as wives must be considerate as well. Our husband comes in after a long day at the office or at work. We're ready to pounce on him right away about the washer that quit, the tests our child failed, the supper that burned. Give him a few moments to mentally regroup and be ready to participate willingly in the family. Some practical ideas to help our marriage be healthy include having a date night every now and then. Do something special for your husband unexpectedly. Tell him you love him frequently. Plan fun activities together. Study God's word and pray with him. Making the choice to marry is in many ways comparable to making the choice to be a Christian. It is a decision involving a major commitment of time, energy, talents, and even an unknown future. Just as a commitment to Christ is like an umbrella over every facet of our lives, so is a commitment in marriage It influences all of life's decisions. It includes being a companion and a friend in both good times and bad times. When there is a husband in the picture, they must both understand that there are physical and emotional differences between the sexes. Each one must be willing to work together to make their marriage the best it can be. Men tend to see the big picture of things, of all of life, and they're not so concerned about all the day-by-day -day details, while women generally are much more concerned about the day-to-day -day details and multitasking to get those accomplished. That's just the way God made man and woman. But if you understand those differences, it can have a major impact on your marriage. Our next puzzle piece is that of home. When a man and woman are married, it creates a household. But you have to work at it to make it a home. The honeymoon is over, and you settle into the reality of living together day by day. It will take both of you with God as the center to make it a home. Each member of the family has a role to play. It is the husband's job to provide the money and spiritual guidance for the family. It's the mother's job to manage the household, all the daily things that must be done. I love my mother's response when people would ask why she didn't work outside the home. She said, 
it's um, Merton was my dad's name said it's Merton's job to make the living it's my job to make it go around she always said she had the hardest job and I, I believe she probably was right on that but as we've already said she doesn't have to do all the things by herself but she must be the one responsible a Christian home will be firmly in place when each member of the house in the house does their part in working together and loving one another and loving God. One of the first decisions that you must make is where to live. Much of that will be determined by where the jobs are located. Our granddaughter Shelby is getting married this summer. Recently, Shelby and Bradley were at our house. Of course, we were talking wedding talk. I asked where they were going to live. Bradley will be working somewhere in uh, Jackson or Henderson, Tennessee, while Shelby completes her last year of college. Ferris and I offered our advice, free of charge, of course. Mm -hmm. We said that during their first several years of marriage, they need to live in a town away from either set of parents. Mm -hmm. That happened to us without our planning it that way, mm -hmm. thanks to the Air Force. We ended up in Charleston, South Carolina, with our parents living in Indiana and Michigan. You know what? It was the best thing that could have ever mm -hmm. happened to us. We found a good congregation where we jumped into the work. We learned we had to depend on each other. We grew so much spiritually because we didn't have family to run to or always having to do things with all the time. Cell phones are really wonderful, useful item to have, but I'm really kind of glad we didn't have them back in 1967. We couldn't run to mama's or call mama at every turn. We couldn't afford to make uh, long distance calls, but that was a blessing to us. One of the best things uh, you can do to make your house a home is to use it to the glory of God. Invite others in for Bible study or for a meal. Here's your kitchen to make a meal to take to someone who is sick or had a death in the family. Use your bedrooms to provide a place to sleep for people passing through. Use your yard to have church gatherings. All these things are doing God's will through your home. One of my favorite hymns is God Give Us Christian Homes. Listen to the words of it. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the Bible is loved and taught. Homes where the master's will is sought. Homes crowned with beauty thy love hath wrought. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the father is true and strong. Homes that are free from the blight of wrong. Homes that are joyous with love and song. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes where the mother in queenly quest strives to show others thy way is best. Homes where the Lord is an honored guest. God give us Christian homes. Use your home to the glory of God. Our seventh puzzle piece is children. Most of us who have children acknowledge that despite the difficulties and sacrifice, we are delighted to have them as part of our life. If you have chosen to be married, then you surely have talked about whether they have children or not. This is a discussion that really should be taking place before the marriage. If the husband or wife is really does not want to have children and the other one really wants to have them, that's going to be some friction that's going to be problematic in that marriage. So make that decision ahead of time. When children do arrive in a home, there will be adjustments that everyone must make. Husband, wife, and yes, even the children have to make adjustments. You now have another life for which you're responsible for training and teaching them God's will. Each child will have their own personality. It is our job as parents to mold and shape those young lives using God's word as our guidebook. Each age will present its own unique joys and struggles. Many decisions will be made 
as to how to accomplish this at various ages. Proverbs 22, 6 tells us, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. As children grow older, they will begin to be involved in various activities. Playing baseball or soccer or doing taekwondo, those are good activities in and of themselves. However, as parents, we need to remember that we set the tone for the home. If little Johnny has baseball practice three nights a week and games the other two nights, and little Sally's playing t-ball three nights a week, and all the while you have school and church activities, life can get crazy. You know what, parents? You are the parent, and it is okay to say we cannot keep on doing this all the time. You may be able to work out a compromise. Maybe one child take a, play a sport in the fall, another child play a sport in the spring. You might need to determine we don't have time for any of those if it means giving up church work. But you uh, need to make sure that every child is doing something along with you in your work for the Lord. Wednesday night Bible study is more important than any ball game on this earth. Any extracurricular activity, if it's keeping your family from your obligations uh, to God, then please choose God. Here are some practical suggestions that can help you make your children to grow in Christ. Do something with each child that they like to do to make them feel special. Make your home available for their friends and activities. When my children were growing up, I always would rather have the neighborhood kids coming to my house where I could control what was being said, what was being done, instead of them going to the neighbor's house where maybe the dad is drinking a beer and and they're doing things they shouldn't be doing. So make your home available for your friend, their friends and activities. Schedule a time uh, to uh, discuss the day's activities. Let them know that you want to know what's happening in their lives. Keep those communication lines open with your children. This one really shouldn't have to be said but tell your children you love them. They need that, and don't spare the hugs. We all need that reassurance that that gives. Praise your children's accomplishments. Know their abilities. Praising a C on a test in history where they are struggling might be a major accomplishment. I remember one time our son Alan came home with a 69 on an algebra test. He was a good student, and math was really his strong suit. So I was about to give him a lecture. But first I said, did you study for the test? He said, yes, Mom, I studied for the test. The highest grade in the test was only a 70. <laughs> Suddenly I knew that it wasn't him. I praised him for having the second highest grade in the class, even though it was a failing grade. It was praiseworthy. Next, study the Bible and pray and have devotionals with your children. This is how they're going to learn to rightly divide God's word. Make sure they are at every church service, even if it means missing a baseball game. Ensure that they are in, in active in all the church activities for their age group. Make memories uh, with your children. It might be taking them on a special trip. It might be sitting at home on a cold night putting together a puzzle. <laughs> One of my fondest memories from growing up in Michigan was that of going to many gospel meetings within a hundred mile radius of Battle Creek. We would leave when dad got home from work. Mom would have fixed sandwiches and we would eat those in the car on the way. If we had any homework, we did that in the car. And then on the way home, we would usually fall asleep 
we each had our spot in the the car. Mine was always in the back window, but of course that was before the days of seat belts. <laughs> but we would do this sometimes two or three times a week during a gospel meeting season. But those are memories that no one can take from me. They're, they're part of my life. Children are a blessing from God, but if we raise our children to be good citizens and get good education and good jobs and fail to teach them to obey God, then we will have failed at what was most important. Listen to the words of the last stanza of the God Give Us Christian Homes. God give us Christian homes, homes where the children are led to know Christ in his beauty who loves them so, homes where the altar fires burn and glow. God give us Christian homes. Sorry. Like I said, that's one of my favorite songs. All right, that takes us to our puzzle piece number eight is spiritual growth. King David tells us in Psalm 37.5 to commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Did you notice we used this same verse for the church puzzle piece? You really can't have spiritual growth without the church. In order for all the family to experience spiritual growth, we must fully invest our time in reading and studying God's word and in prayer. Just going to a worship service once a week will not be sufficient. Many people think that Bible class teachers and the preacher and the youth minister are the ones who are giving us what we need to be seeing spiritual growth. Whoa, wait a minute, where are the parents here? It's the parents that should be teaching their children. The Bible class teachers, the preacher, the youth minister, should be reinforcing what you are teaching your children and not the other way around. The following poem expresses the way that many of us live our lives. The author is unknown. I got up one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't have time to pray. Problems just tumbled upon me and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me. He said, but you didn't seek. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys in the lock. God gently chided and lovingly chided, my child, you didn't knock. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. Prayer has got to be a part of our spiritual growth. Have you set spiritual goals for yourself and your family? We talked earlier about setting other goals, but we need spiritual goals. We need to prioritize those goals. And then we need to list activities that can be done to help reach those goals. How can you prevent your life from becoming overscheduled? Be willing to stop and evaluate how you spend your time. Be willing to choose the best activities. No one can do all the activities all the time. Be willing to say no to extra activities that will hurt your spiritual growth. We are now ready for puzzle piece number nine. You have probably guessed by now that this piece is God. Our Heavenly Father must be the biggest piece of our life. If you notice on our puzzle, God touches every puzzle piece that we've discussed. God must be the center of our life. To keep him in the center of our life, we must spend time with him each and every day. When we read the Bible, that's God talking to us. When we pray, we are talking to God. We need both of these 
for communication to happen. It does no good if you do just one part and not the other. We must include God at every step or phase of our life. Here are some suggestions to make sure that our communication with God is open and being used. Try to schedule a certain time of the day to read and study your Bible. And as a sidelight, I would emphasize for young mothers, do that. I know it would be nice to wait until the children are asleep or something, but our children need to see us reading our Bible. So you may have to spend some time when they're down or uh, asleep or whatever, but let them see you reading the Bible some. Set aside a time other than mealtime to pray deep, thoughtful prayers. Volunteer to teach or help in a Bible class. While preparing a lesson to teach, you will learn more than you'll learn sitting in a Bible class. Select Bible topics and research and study the related scriptures. Prepare for Bible classes in which you are a student by reading the assigned scriptures. So many times we walk into a, a, a particularly adult Bible class, but it happens as uh, teenagers and younger even, that we know what's going to be discussed, but we've done absolutely nothing to prepare for it. You're not going to get nearly mm -hmm. as much out of it. To summarize the puzzle that we've put together, I want us to look at Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. This is the description of the virtuous woman. We will each show each verse and then tag a piece of our puzzle that goes with it. Starting in verse 10. An excellent wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. Parents. They raised her in the right way. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. Husband. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Husband. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. Home. She is like ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. Home. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and fortunes for her maidens. Children and home. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. Career. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Self. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. Career and home. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. Home. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. Spiritual growth. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Home and children. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Self. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land husband and church. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Career. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. Spiritual growth. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Spiritual growth and church. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Home. Her children rise up and call her blessed. 
her husband also, and he praises her, children and husband. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all, self and parents. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. God, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gate. God and spiritual growth. Did you notice that it ends with God and spiritual growth? Those two things should sum up a lot in our lives. Here is how each piece fit into the, the virtuous woman scripture. Self was three times, parents two times, church two times, career three times, husband four times, home seven times, children three times, spiritual growth five times, and God two times. By looking at Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, we can see how the virtuous woman was fitting the pieces together in her life. Every one of you is a, a piece in your puzzle of life. What other pieces fit together to make your puzzle complete? We are all different, so each puzzle may look a little different. One person's puzzle may not have children in it. Another puzzle may not have a, a spouse any longer in it, but the puzzle of your life will all come together when God is at the center of it and you stay focused on him. Fitting pieces together is a lifelong journey. May God bless each one of you as you walk through this puzzle that we call life. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, bless the ladies who are here Bless each one of us and our households. Help us to work diligently to fit these puzzle pieces together that our puzzle will fit and will be what it needs to be for you. Help us, Father, to put you first in our life above anything and everything. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I have up here something for you, each of you. So when we're done, please feel free to come up and get one. Since we've been talking about puzzles, I wanted to do, give something to you. So we have a cookie up here that is a puzzle for each of you to take. And thank you for listening so much.